Africa has witnessed the rise and fall of various kingdoms and civilizations. But in around the time Jesus Christ was born, what was happening in East Africa? Let's first go a little back to 980 BC, a time when the kingdom of Damot was born. This kingdom is often forgotten, but it is believed to have been ruled by the biblical Queen of Sheba, who is said to have visited King Solomon. It was located in modern-day Eritrea and northern Ethiopia and existed alongside the great kingdoms of Egypt and Kush. In the 700s BC, Yeha is established as the administrative and religious center and a Judaic temple and palace are built. Emerging from the early Adamot civilization, the kingdom of Aksum is founded in 150 BC. This kingdom would go ahead to be considered one of the four great powers of the third century, together with Persia, Rome, and China by the Persian prophet Mani. Time went by, and in 30 BC, Queen Cleopatra VII of Egypt is defeated and deposed by the Romans. This ended the Ptolemaic period and ushered in the start of the Roman Egypt. Further south, the Romans attempt to take over the kingdom of Meroe, but led by their queen Amanirenas, the Meroids defeat them. This kingdom would last for four more centuries. I am talking less about these Nubian kingdoms of Kama, Meroe and Napata, because I have extensively covered them in two of my older videos. I will leave the link in the description if you haven't checked them out. During the mid-first century AD, a Greek-speaking Egyptian merchant sails to Eastern Africa and records his journey on the periplus of Eritrean Sea. He mentions that there were already numerous prosperous cities in Eastern Africa, like Opon, Mundus, and Rapta. Aksum is also mentioned here as a great kingdom. Between 240 and 260 AD, the Aksumites expand their kingdom significantly stretching from the Ethiopian highlands to the Arabian Peninsula in the east and to the border with Egypt to the west. An important moment arrives between 325 to 328 AD when the ruler of Aksum, King Ezana, converts to Christianity and his kingdom independently adopts the religion. This is around the same time Christianity was being adopted in Europe and it was just 13 years after Constantine became the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity. King Ezana tries to convert everybody forcefully and in 350, the kingdom of Simeon is established by the Jewish population. These Jews were against the Christian conversion and wanted to maintain their traditions. They would later be called bitter Israel. Meanwhile, King Ezana invades Nubia, leading to its decline. This marks the end of an era. In 390, Aksumite monks begin to translate the Bible into Jez, their own language, a Bible which would come to be the oldest and most complete in the world, preserving various documents which were lost to the West. For perspective, the Bible is over a thousand years older than the King James Version. During this time of the Christian era in Aksum, the Judaic Yeha Temple is also converted into a church. Back in Nubia, in 400 AD, there was witnessed the simultaneous rise of three Nubian kingdoms, Nobatia, Makuria, and Alodia. In the 500s, the Hala kingdom was birthed. The kingdom had trading relations with the Ayubi dynasty of Egypt and Tang dynasty of China also established its own currency and calendar. The mid-500s witnessed the conversion of Nobidia and Makuria to Christianity. Alodia is the last of the three to convert in 580. A cathedral is also established at Faras, marking the Christian era in Nubia. In the early 600s, Makuria is thought to have annexed its northern neighbor, Nobatia, therefore increasing its territory. In 613, a group of the first followers of Islam from Mecca, who were fleeing persecution, arrived in Aksum. They were comprised of 12 men and 4 women, including Muhammad's daughter, Rukaya, 
and are granted asylum in the Christian kingdom. This act is considered by many as significant in the Muslim faith. In 620, the trans-Indian ocean trade with East Africans began. This region would be known as Zanj or Zinj by the Persians, Arabs, Indians and Chinese. In 640, the expansion of the Rashidun Caliphate in Arabia greatly impacted the Aksumite Kingdom. The kingdom's last three centuries are considered a dark age which also halted their queen production. In 850, the city of Malindi is founded as a Swahili state and appears to have been destroyed around 1000 AD. In 896, one of the earliest known Muslim kingdoms in the Horn of Africa, the Sultanate of Shewa, sprang up in the Hala country. Fast forward to 960, the Jewish queen Judith from the neighboring Simeon kingdom attacked Aksum. She brought by the destruction of its churches and monuments, bringing the kingdom to an end. It is said that she was seeking revenge, for the church had earlier sold her into slavery. In 900, a new dynasty called Zagwe is established, replacing Aksum. This dynasty is important as it restores back the Christian faith of Abyssinia, and as we shall see, their king, Gebre Meskela Libela, is credited with having constructed the iconic Rokhun monolithic churches, which will be named after him. The 900s were a great time for the emergence of wealthy and powerful East African states. The Sultanate of Mogadishu emerges around this time, or a little earlier, and they start minting their coins. Archaeological excavations indicate they traded with China, Sri Lanka, and even Vietnam. In the mid-900s, Kilwa Kisiwani in present-day Tanzania is founded. This city challenged the dominance held by Mogadishu on the East African coast. The 10th century Arab geographer Abu al-Hassan mentions its king's title as Mfalme. This is still the Swahili word for king, and it indicates that the language had already been born by this time. A few years later, Mombasa is founded further north as another Swahili city-state. By the early 1000s, another prosperous Swahili city-state called Lam was established. Meanwhile, Sofala emerges as a small trading post and was incorporated into the greater global Indian Ocean trade network. Merchants from the Sultanate of Mogadishu in the north used to get gold and other items from here but they kept the trading post a secret from their Kilwan rivals who didn't know its existence. In the 1180s, Sultan Suleiman Hassan of Kilwa seized control of Sofala and brought the city into the Kilwa Sultanate and the Swahili cultural sphere. This would become the southernmost Swahili city-state. At this time, Kilwa was also starting to gain political control over other Swahili towns. Back in Abyssinia in 1187, King Lalibela begins the construction of the rock-hewn churches in a bid to build what he termed as a new Jerusalem. The churches themselves date way back to the 7th century, but they are traditionally dated to the reign of King Lalibela following the capture of Jerusalem. The reason for this dating is that it is said after Jerusalem was destroyed in the late 1180s, King Lalibela said he'd construct the churches as a symbolic representation of Jerusalem. By the 1200s, Malindi reemerges and appears to be a very prosperous Swahili state. The city is positioned a little south from its predecessor. Not far from here, another mysterious Swahili state emerges, a city way ahead of its time. Gedi was large and advanced. The city was carefully arranged with water wells, advanced sanitation, bathroom drainage systems and overhead basins to flush toilets. At the same time, Mogadishu along with other coastal and interior Somali cities in southern Somalia and eastern Abyssinia come under the Ajuran Sultanate. During this period, many regions and people in the southern part of the Horn of Africa converted to Islam. In 1270, 
the Abyssinian kingdom is founded and the Zagwe dynasty is replaced by the Solomonic dynasty who claim to trace their roots back to the biblical king Solomon and the queen of Sheba. Abyssinia would stand strong to become the only African state to resist colonial rule 600 years later. The state religion had evolved into the Orthodox Tawahedo or Ethiopian Orthodox and Eritrean Orthodox Church. In 1331, Ibn Battuta arrives in Mogadishu, which was known in Arabic as Bilad al-Babas, meaning the land of the Babas. He described it as an exceedingly large city with many rich merchants, noted for its high quality fabric that was exported to other countries, including Egypt. Ibn Battuta continued by ship south to the Swahili coast, a region then known in Arabic as the Bilad al-Zanj, and had an overnight stop at the island town of Mombasa. Ibn Battuta goes further down and arrives in the Kilwa Sultanate. He stated that the authority of the sultan extended from Malindi in the north to Inhambane in the south and described the city as one of the finest and most beautifully built towns. During this time, the Christian kingdoms of Makuria and Alodia begin to decline, and by 1365, Makuria had virtually collapsed and was reduced to a small kingdom restricted to Noa Nubia, until finally disappearing 150 years later. In 1370, Lamu is established as another powerful Swahili city-state. By this time, at least 37 substantial Swahili trading towns in southern Somalia Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique and Comoros had already emerged, many of them quite wealthy. In the 1400s, one kingdom in the interior under King Gihanga managed to incorporate several of its close neighboring territories, thereby establishing the kingdom of Rwanda. In 1414, the towns of Malindi and Mogadishu are visited by the Chinese explorer Zheng He. Zheng He gifted the people porcelain, silver and silk, and in return, China received ostriches, zebras, camels and ivory from the towns. Malindi's ruler sent a personal envoy with a giraffe as a present to China on that fleet. A year later, in 1415, the Adal Sultanate is formed. At its height, it controlled the territory stretching from the easternmost point of Somalia and here mainland Africa to the port city of Suakin in Sudan. In 1427, the Abyssinian emperor Yeshak sends an envoy to the king of Aragon in Spain to forge an alliance against the Muslims. In 1441, an act of union is signed in Rome between the Church of Abyssinia and the Church of Rome. In 1490, the kingdom of Shiluk in present-day South Sudan is established. In 1498, Vasco da Gama becomes the first non-European to visit Mombasa on his way to India, where he received a chilly reception. He sailed further north and met Malindi authorities in the same year to sign a trade agreement and hire a guide for the voyage to India. Vasco da Gama was given a warm reception from the Sultan of Malindi and he erected a padrao known today as the Vasco da Gama pillar. In 1502, Mombasa became independent from Kilwa Kisiwani and was renamed as Mvita in Swahili or Mombasa in Arabic which evolved to Mombasa. In 1505, The Portuguese with Malindi support successfully conquered the towns of Kilwa and Mombasa. This led to the decline of the two states and the flourishing of Malindi. In the middle of the 16th century, the Adal Sultanate led by Hala and their Somali allies invaded Abyssinia. You may have heard about the Ethiopian rum meat eating tradition and yeah, it is thought to have started this time as a survival tactic. They thought if they lit the fire to cook their meat, then their enemies would be able to tell their location from the smoke. Anyway, this war coincided with the Hala tribe's disappearance, possibly due to the brands of war, destitution, or assimilation. In 1592, a tribe called Segeju occupied Mombasa 
eventually surrendering it to the Sheikh of Malindi. The Sheikh then moves his court from Malindi to Mombasa and rules from 1593 to 1630. During this time, he invites his allies, the Portuguese, to build a garrison and they dominate the city. In 1600, the Buganda Kingdom emerges along the shores of Lake Victoria. Its principal rival is the neighboring state of Bunyoro. In 1602, Malik Amba, who was born in the Adar Sultanate in the Horn of Africa, took a vast area in the Deccan region of India. There, he founds the city of Kadki, which will become his new capital, and rules this region. In 1635, Ethiopian Emperor Fasilades establishes a new capital at Gonda, marking the start of a new golden age. This time saw relative peace and the successful integration of the Oromo. In 1650, Gedi is abandoned due to a lot of factors, including Wazimba raid along the coast, Oromo migrations to the south and raids from Somalia. In 1698, the Omani Arabs drive out the Portuguese out of the Swahili coast and take control of Mombasa and in the following year, they take control of the island of Zanzibar. During this time, they expand their empire from the Middle East all the way down to the eastern coast of Africa. At the end of this century, the Ajuran state disintegrated into several successor kingdoms and states. Meanwhile, Kilwa Kisiwani in the south is also departed which led to the town gradually declining until it almost disappeared. During the 1700s, the kingdom of Buganda grew rapidly in power, becoming the dominant kingdom in the region. In 1840, Said Said, the Sultan of Oman, moves his capital from Muscat to Zanzibar, which will soon evolve into the largest slave trading state in East Africa. During this time, Swahili and Arab traders extend trading routes for enslaved people and ivory across the interior of East Africa. This was a significant time for the Swahili language as various communities adopted it as a secondary language. In 1855, Raskasa unifies the warring states of Abyssinia and crowns himself Emperor Tiwodros II. His rule is often placed as the beginning of modern Ethiopia. In 1861, Malindi is refounded by Sultan Majid of Zanzibar and until the end of the 19th century, this place served as a slave trade center. In 1868, Abyssinian Emperor Tiwodros II is defeated by the British at the Battle of Magdala and subsequently he takes his own life. His son Alemayu is abducted by the British and is taken under the care of Queen Victoria who grew a fondness for the boy, but he still experienced racial discrimination from others. I've attached the link in the description if you wanna learn about the sad story of this boy, which led to his demise at just the age of 18. In 1885, the colonial conquest began and the German establishes a protectorate over the coast of Tanganyika, which would later be known as mainland Tanzania. In 1889, Emperor Menelik II, who is now residing in Addis Ababa, conquered many peoples and kingdoms. Ten years later, Abyssinia had expanded into its modern territorial boundaries. In 1894, Uganda is occupied by the British, who begin to form the colony of Uganda. In 1896, Abyssinians, under Emperor Menelik II, defeat the Italians at the famous Battle of Adwa and becomes the only African nation to successfully resist European conquest during this period. In this year too, on August 27, the shortest recorded war in history occurs between Zanzibar and the British. It is said that the war took between 38 to 45 minutes. By this time, the Zanzibar Sultanate was controlling vast territories in present-day Kenya and Tanzania. Ultimately, Sultan Khalid surrenders Zanzibar to the British. In 1899, the British and French established joint rule over Sudan, while Germany conquers Rwanda. A year later, 
the first white settlers arrive in Kenya. In 1905, anti-colonial resistance began in German East Africa with the Majimaji uprising. And in the following year, Britain, France and Italy agreed to recognize the independence of Abyssinia. In 1923, Abyssinia becomes the first African nation to join the League of Nations. In 1930, Rastafari is crowned Emperor Haile Selassie of Abyssinia. And in the following year, he declares that the country would henceforth be known as Ethiopia. On October 3, 1935, Italy invades Ethiopia. And in the following year, Addis Ababa is conquered by Italian forces. Mussolini declares the conquest as the foundation of the new Roman Empire. On June 30, 1936, Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie appeals to the League of Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, to assist his country in expelling the Italian invaders. His attempts were futile, but in 1941, Ethiopia, with the assistance of British forces, defeats the Italians and re-establishes its independence, being the last surviving African kingdom. During this time and before, Ethiopia's independence influenced other African colonies to fight for their independence. By the late 1950s, the colonies start gaining independence, ushering in the new modern era. You may have noticed that some kingdoms have been left out because East Africa had lots of kingdoms, which we couldn't cover on one video. Therefore, we just picked up some of the major powers of the region. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon in our next video.